them in the chat. So please bow your head as we go before the Lord. We thank you today, God. You are awesome. You are wondrous, God. You are mighty, Father. You are everything that we need. You are a healer. You are a comforter, Lord. We know that those are some have lost their loved ones this week. We pray, God, that you go before them. Be the comfort and the peace that they need, Lord God. Be everything that we need, Lord. We know that we don't always tell everybody what's going on, God. But you know what's in our hearts. You know what's going on in our homes, what's on our jobs, God. But we thank you, God, that you are a mighty conqueror. That there is nothing too hard for you, God. That whatever we need, God, you are that thing. We ask that you would send your anointing today, God. Today, God. Oh, Next to up, Lord, it just needs to feel your presence, God. Because you are here. And because he is here, whatever you need, your healing, your deliverance, your finances, God, your family, he is here. Hallelujah, we thank you, God. We ask that you bless the word, God, as it go forth, that it be mighty and powerful. Let some life be changed. Let someone come before you, Lord God, and say, what can I do to be saved this day? We thank you, God, for who you are and all that you've done. And we bless you in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. And all your people said, hallelujah, as we stand to your feet. Let's give God some glory. Is he worthy today? Come on and praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper.
allow us to be your voice. Speak to us and speak through us. You promised too, too much for us to leave the same way we came. We give you permission to push us into our purpose. We give you permission to read us like a towel until you get every drop. We declare we'll give you all the honor, all of the glory, all of the praise. Because God can't nobody do us like you. All the people of God said, Amen. Amen. If you feel like praising, put your hands together one more time. If you've been better than good, come on, put them together again. If you look in the open,
But notice his praise. I would notice how he would put his hand with the partial. And I wonder how often we take for granted that we got both of them. We up here in the God. And we got two hands. I wonder. Gym, I saw a guy roll into the gym on a wheelchair to work out. Yeah. And here I'm having conversations with people talking about, yeah, I was going to go to the gym, but I just didn't.
just some background right quick before we get into it. Uh, we kicked off the year of destination growth with an incredible series called New Year, New Doors. That's where we saw that just because you walk into a new year, that growth sometimes means walking through a new door. Yeah. We just wrapped up our frenemies series that really challenged us to not just look at the frenemies in our lives, in our inner circle, but understand how there are times when we make ourselves frenemies to God. But today, our new series is, It's Time to Get in the Game. It is time to get in the game. Because it doesn't matter if you walk through a new door or if you become a friend of God, if at the end of the day, you choose to stay on the sidelines. Wow. We understand that life has a way of life. It does. Life has a way of leaving us injured and stealing our passion and causing us to lose divine perspective to where we think we don't belong in the game. That, that others can play the game better than us. Or that I'm too hurt to be helpful. So it's easier for me to just sit this one out. So in this series, we will be diving into God's word to see how we can take steps to get in the game. And as a, as a precursor, I'm just letting you know in advance, I'm going to be more exegetical in my preaching today, so it might seem more didactic than sermonic. It, it might seem more like teaching than preaching. But, but for us to grow um, uh, and eat meat, uh, sometimes you can't have a bottle and burp. <laughs> Sometimes you need the nourishment required that requires eating and digesting. You can't be on milk all your life. Sometimes you're going to have to have some substance. I know that many of us, if you old school, when you initially heard the sermon title, uh, your mind went back to the, the movie The Sixth Sense, where there was this little, little boy, and he was talking to the counselor, and, he had, and the counselor said, Come on, you can tell me the honest truth. What's the problem? And the little boy said, Sometimes I see dead people. That's not what this is about. <laughs> Just letting you know, if your mind went there, because you know how we are. That's not what we're talking about today. Paul is saying, I want to talk about salvific sense, not six sense. Paul is saying, I know what I'm looking at because I used to be who I'm looking at. Right. Ephesians 2 and 1 uh, through 3 says, And you as he quickened or given life who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you were formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And we often overlook how the chapter actually begins. Because how a thing begins, you really set a precedence on how it's going to proceed. And the chapter begins with the coordinated conjunction, and. It says, it says and. And, uh, and what this is telling us is that this chapter is connected to the previous chapter. Ephesians 1 gives us the past, present, and future of God's amazing plan of salvation. Chapter 2 gives us the past, present, and future of the people whom God saved. Chapter 1 gives us God's perspective. Chapter 2 gives us humanity's perspective. Chapter 1 starts with God's election prior to creation. Chapter 2 starts with our lost condition prior to yeah. salvation. Chapter 1 ends with all things being subject to Jesus. Chapter 2 ends with the church being built up as God's dwelling place. So Paul in chapter 2 is conveying the transformative power of God's grace in salvation. Paul's assignment is to give us hope. Because when you feel like you messed up in life, the first thing that goes is hope. The hope that you can still be who God has called you to be. The, the hope that God can still love somebody who's fallen so short. The hope that God will still desire to have a relationship somebody like me. The hope that God can still use somebody like me to do kingdom that has all the, the hope that I can still make a difference even though I took a detour. The hope that I cannot outsee God's grace. I don't know, but sometimes when you've done so much stuff, all you need is a little hope. Disclaimer because um, some of the pictures in this pericope are not going to 
and, and I understand how often in Christianity we want to hear the good stuff. <laughs> we want to hear the nice stuff. We, we want the stuff that makes us feel good about ourselves. But, but the transparency and the authenticity of Scripture does not lend itself to exclusivity. In other words, the Word of God has no redactions. In the judicial system, when they don't want you to see something as bad, they redact it or they cross it out. They put it in black so no one ever sees your stuff. The Bible. Yes. <laughs> the Bible is so transparent and God is so amazing that he does not care about redaction because he has the power to redeem. Yes. So God is saying, I don't care about your historical stuff. I don't care what you messed up here. I don't care who you slept with. God can 
deliver somebody like me with the dirt that I had and clean me up, imagine what God can do. Here's the problem in the church. We don't look at people as people who can be delivered from their dirt. Right? And delivering God, we look at people who need to be distanced from because we finally got ourselves clean.
know, and mama had to get my hand. So they bought the grinder, bought the grinder, and they bought the grinder, and it did not work. They plugged it up, it did not work at all. So you know how they do this. If you don't know, I had to step in the mediate and I said, hey, we need a new driver. I said, no problem, call, get the driver. We had to wait 13 days and the driver comes, they plug it up. It doesn't work. My son says, hey dad, I think I can fix it. So now they leave, but now I got my son who ain't getting paid to try to fix a brand new car. So my son does something and it works. It works for a whole week. And then it stops. And if you don't leave the water, now I got to be getting in. I said, hold on, wait a minute, let me put some Jesus in there. So I had to call. They said, hey, we're so sorry. We'll send out a brand new car. I was like, okay, bring it in. We got to wait 13 more days. Brand new car comes. This is the third car. They come and they bring the third car. The guy comes in, he plugs in the wall. I'm watching. <laughs> he plugs into the wall. It does not start. It does not. It, there is no juice. There's nothing happening. I'm like, wait a minute. What are we going to do? He says, you need an electrician. I said, well, I need an electrician, but I got a brand new driver. The old driver was working. Why didn't the driver not work? He says, I don't know. That's not my job. I'm on. I call the electrician. The electrician comes in. He comes in. He takes the panel off the wall. Calls me, said, Mr. Ford, I found it. I found your pants. I said, well, wait a minute. You only been here five minutes. He said, no problem. Look, let, me, let me show you. He said, you see these two wires? I said, yes. He said, these two wires right here, someone had cut them, and instead of just taking them out and putting two new wires in, they decided they're just going to put electrical tape around the wires, and the wires got dazzled. It could have caused an electrical fire, but don't worry about it. I'm going to take these out, put brand new in. You're good to go. He plugs back in. It works like a charm. I'm pushing all the buttons. I'm opening all the doors. Everything's working. Now here's the problem. Before he did what he did, I was pushing buttons and it wasn't working. I was opening doors and it wasn't working. Nothing I did was making it work. It wasn't working because there was no connection. And looking at the enemy. And looking at the boy. 
Lord. And looking at the enemy. And he tells the enemy, you are right. That is check. And the enemy said, I told you you couldn't mess with me. I told you you couldn't deal with me. I told you. I told you. Do you see what happens when I run this world? Do you see what happens when I make people hate for no reason? Do you see what happens when I make people discriminate just because? Do you see what happens when I institute systematic racism? Do you see what happens when I make people grind so that they're too tired to serve God? Do you see what happens when I make people work until they don't want to worship? Do you see what happens when I make people love the creation more than the creator? You thought you had me, but I And the chess master, George, oh, yes. uh -huh. ate it all up. Just ate it up. He said, you're right. Everything so far that you said, you're right. You was running it. And the enemy said, what you call run? He said, you was running it. But you need to look at the board. It is check. But it ain't checkmate. Because I've got one more move that I can make. Those of us who've been going through life thinking that the enemy is one, oh, God told me to tell you, you got one more move yeah. that you can make. Because believers never lose. We only learn lessons. The, the uniqueness about this epistle is that, is that Paul is writing this epistle from his perspective. But Paul is trying to convey to us why he understands the walking dead so well. <laughs> Paul tells us in, in Timothy that Jesus came to save sinners for whom I was chief. Paul says, I was that guy. <laughs> in fact, I was worse than that guy. And, 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 and if the heart of that guy can be changed, God can change anyone's heart. Paul is trying to convey that he was the guy, and so he understands the urgency and the significance of no longer being that guy. I, I'm hoping that this part resonates with someone, someone who remembers that they haven't been saved all their life. Someone who is a worshiper today, but you were a wreck yesterday. Someone who was a praiser today, but you was a problem yesterday. Someone who was out there and understands the unique component that God gives humanity as a life preserver. I need you to understand verse 8. Verse 8 says, For by grace are we saved through faith. Not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest anyone can take credit. Yeah, yeah. Let me just say it one time. Let me just say grace. grace. Grace is the common denominator that separates the walking dead from worshipers. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I found out at Figueroa Street Elementary School in Los Angeles, California. I found out one thing in elementary school. I found out in kindergarten that all means all. And when Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that means all means all. That, that's what Miss Christensen said in the first year. She said all means all. So I, I know that all means all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what that tells us is all of us at one point in life have been the walking dead. Yes, yes. All of us. And I said, God, you got to get me out of this. Because they're going to be looking at me like, wait a minute. <laughs> you need to put some Jesus in this, right? What, what do we call? And I said, I said they, they've got to get the component of grace. Yeah. They've got to understand what grace is. Yeah. That, that God extended his grace toward us so that we might be saved. Yeah. Grace is God's divine initiative that bridges the gap between humanity's fallen state and God's perfect holiness. Grace offers reconciliation and redemption to the ratchet. Grace is God's incomprehensible compassion for the least of these. Paul says in Titus 3, 7 that we are justified yes. by God's grace. Yes. God, I'm sorry. Just, okay. The, the importance of this is that 
Believers being justified takes away the imposter syndrome that the enemy wants to feed us. The enemy wants believers to feel as if they don't deserve a seat at the table. The enemy wants us to feel like we don't deserve to enter into God's gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. The enemy wants us to feel that we don't deserve to lift holy hands because we haven't always been holy. The, the, the enemy wants us to feel that because of your mistakes that God can't make you a miracle. But because of grace's justification, it changed the game. Lean in, family. Justification is an act of God whereby he declares a sinner to be righteous based on what Jesus did. Yeah. I'm going to get to the end. He, he declares a sinner to be righteous based on what Jesus did. God, because Jesus suffered bad night and rose three days later, he paid the price for the guilty sinner that the sinner couldn't pay. So what justification does is, for the believer, is that justification says, I know you sinned, but because you accepted my son, I'm going to impute my son's righteousness on you so that when I look at you, I don't see you, I see him. Yeah. Oh, you have to go all the way down to the court. Oh. 
And that person right there, they'll show you where to stay. Wow. I said, bet. I'm down at the court. I'm looking at, understand, Will Chamberlain, wow. Elgin Baylor, wow. Gail Goodrich, yeah. and Jerry West yeah. for a Hall of Famers. I'm down at court side. So I get rid of lady my like chick and say, where do I sit? <laughs> she says, right there. Yeah. She says, excuse me. <laughs> I pray that it has made a difference even now. 